So, I'd like to know who among you, as an introductory question, is happy with democracy in his or her country? Raise your hand. Are you happy with democracy in your country, the way it goes, the way it works? Satisfied or not satisfied? There's no right or wrong answer, but I see only a few hands being raised. So that is unfortunately the case with many citizens today. Uh, according to surveys, somewhere between 60 to 80 percent of citizens in different countries feel that democracy isn't going well. So that's representative democracy as we know it. And I wanted to start with this because that is for me the background in which we should think about um, lobbying and how to do lobbying and how to be effective in your different venues and your different contexts to influence whatever authorities that you are dealing with. Um, the downside to that already negative statistic is that about a third of citizens now think that we should have new forms of governance, not democracy, but other ways of governing ourselves. Now, that is obviously because uh, the traditional way with representation is felt as not being sufficient. But I think that is a fig leaf which hides another tree, which is uh, that of indirect representation through lobby groups. So we, when we think of demo um, representative democracy, we think of the fact that we elect representatives, but we also unofficially let representatives, i.e. lobby groups, do the representation for us to the elected representatives. So there's a, there's a real issue, and the surveys on lobbying show that people are extremely dissatisfied with interest groups, with the way their interests are being represented in the private sector to the public authorities. And the public authorities themselves see lobbying as increasingly intransparent, and while they think they need it, they see the, the lobbying as, as being a problem in democracy itself. So we have an issue with lobbying. So I'm not going to be able today to give you an exact crash course into how to be an effective lobbyist in the old school way. I will give you some tips, I will give you some key elements of how to build a strategy, and we'll have an exercise later when you can try and apply this. In any case, you've already been given the key tip, the key insight from the previous speaker in three words, it's know your audience. If you start from there and you think it through, you've already done 90% of the job, or, or you've done 90% of my job today. But so what I'm going to do is try and give you a bit of context about how to contextualize, how to think about lobbying in your different venues, also understanding that you all have very different jobs, all have very different contexts. Um, and also to contextualize it in this context of an evolving democracy, of citizen dissatisfaction, of people wanting to be empowered in their workplace and in democracy um, in general. We've had some, um, some polls and, and thank you to all those who have answered it, but just to help me a little bit more, who at the moment has lobbying projects underway? Who is involved in lobbying? If you could raise your hand again, a little bit of gymnastics. <laughs> Why are you raising it so low? It's like uh, you seem embarrassed. Um, so it's really quite a few. Who will have lobbying to do in the, um, in the near future? A few more? OK. So it's clearly not a majority. Um, so that helps me perhaps try to adapt and bear with me uh, with this improvisation, I will be less focused on, you know, how to lobby the EU institutions to get um, your projects approved or uh, to uh, change a regulation, which apparently will not concern most of you, to a broader definition of advocacy. Lobbying is, if you want to be precise academically, it's the targeting of public authorities to obtain a public decision in your favor, presumably, or opposing a decision that you're against, 
So it's seeking, it's targeting specifically public authorities to get a decision from them, okay? Bearing in mind that the definition of power is the ability to effect change, and those in who have public authority are the ones who have the power to take decisions, so that's the, you know, first circle, that's lobbying. I will take a broader definition here, which is advocacy, which is the ways and means by which you can persuade others to see your cause favorably, okay? So it's not just public authorities, it's a wider set of targets, and it's not just uh, obtaining a positive decision from a public authority, it's, you know, favoring your cause more generally. Um, so, in order to, to explore this, I would first like to introduce a concept, and I hope you'll be able to see this, um, but anyway, I'll explain it. So, we're moving from an idea of power, which I will call old power, to an idea of power, which I will call, and, uh, and, and this is not just me, but whatever, new power. So, in the old conception, let's say 19th, 18th, 19th, 20th century, in old power you have a very centric mode of decision making, hierarchical, based on expertise, aiming at stability. In, um, in computing, we use the term uh, big design up front, so focused on expertise that lays out plans that allow you to uh, define clear objectives and a plan to meet them. So this approach is increasingly leaving citizens and different players frustrated, also in the workplace. And it's seeding, um, and it's coexisting today with another form of power, which is, uh, which we can call new power, where the distribution of power is much more uh, widespread, so it's a distributed form of governance, where collaboration, as opposed to top-down decision-making, is valued, where the expertise is not seen as limited to a small group of people, but where people expect collective intelligence, participation, sharing of ideas, um, and where the authority <coughs> is meant not to come from a hierarchical structure, but from affiliation of people wanting to follow and, and wanting to be convinced and wanting to share their affiliation, which is more volatile. And again, these two worlds today coexist. As citizens, as consumers, as, um, as uh, working in, in the workplace, we're getting more and more used to challenging authority, to expressing our opinion, to, um, to taking part in various ways, to choices and decision making. And today we see different forms of power coexisting and we haven't yet, whether in the workplace or in, uh, in, in democracy, in our institutional system, we haven't yet fully worked out how to make these different forms of power um, coexist and, and evolve to new forms of decision making. So to take an example, we'll try and structure this with your examples. Um, these under, underpinning these systems are a set of values that, um, that uh, I, I laid out. So um, in the new, you have informed, um, distributed, I should have written them down earlier, but I'll repeat, um, collaboration focused, uh, not a few number, but a diversity of forms of expertise. Um, something I didn't mention earlier, this approach values transparency as opposed to a more centric 
hierarchical, <coughs> top-down, expertise-focused, and um, more discretion, if not secrecy, prone. So old power in this in these two visions is more like a currency, a currency you hold and you don't share. And the more currency you have, the more <coughs> attention you get from lobbyists, advocates of different causes who want to obtain something from you. So I'll symbolize this with a, a euro. <coughs> this is the, the currency model. In the new power form uh, vision or way of living it, it's a bit more like a flow, like a river, uh, or like electricity, where your role when you have power in that format, in that approach, is not so much to keep it, but to distribute it and to channel it. If you're the person or the organization that channels power in that approach, you have, <coughs> you have power, but you don't hold it, you don't keep it to yourself, you don't try to maximize it. To make this more concrete, can you think of examples of people who have, this will be probably the easiest, an old power conception of, uh, uh, an old power approach to their organization and these values? You don't have to quote your employee immediately uh, if that's what springs to mind, but um, I don't know if that's the case. But who could we think of in that approach? Andrea? <laughs> <laughs> Don't follow, run ahead. <laughs> um, yes? So interesting, <laughs> because Donald Trump, I would put in this category. He uses old power, now he's the president of the United States, <laughs> right? And, but he relies on values that are new. So look at his use of Twitter. Now, it might, he's not just here, right? Other examples? Here I would also put um, Cinque Stelle, okay? They, they originally say, we're gonna consult people, etc. So the values, the language, etc., is new world, new power type. But the <coughs> way they conduct, as far as I know, I'm not Italian and we can d dispute these categorizations, but the way they conduct their business, etc., and now in power, is very much old power, I believe. Other examples, Macron. So, where would you put Macron? <laughs> Same as Trump. <laughs> Not, sorry? <laughs> Not as blunt as Trump. So it's interesting because Macron, I think, has moved. So definitely during the campaign, adopting the language uh, of, and the campaign itself, very much like Obama in 2008, being based on a flow of partisans mobilizing, giving them authority, giving them the power to self-organize, etc. So both the structure and the values were here, but indeed, now he's here, right? And his movement is feeling a lot of tension because uh, disappointed. So I think you, could, you can put Obama here as well. Um, Putin, here, okay. <laughs> Any dispute? <laughs> no? Um, what example did I have for the other ones? Um, <coughs> so, where? New forms of power? Well, it's a bit like Trump. It's a traditional party seeking power in the traditional form. 
but with values and collaboration <laughs> in some ways. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, we could be more precise. It's the, the point here, we could continue this, but is to make you reflect on what sort of power are you in in this transition phase? You know, we usually tend to have lobbying classes in the notion that the world is still here. But that's not the case. Um, and one has to navigate these tensions and these contradictions. Um, and maybe yourselves want to ask yourselves, where do you stand on this two by two? Um, and where do you want to be? Or where do you want your organization to be? How do you want your organization to mobilize power, mobilize a community, or hoard power, etc.? So that's the first notion I wanted to introduce. Um, the second notion I wanted <coughs> to introduce, which makes all this complex, even more complex, which is uh, probably familiar to many of you. Who, who's familiar with the concept, the acronym VUCA? Anyone? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Did you read it? Okay, do you remember what the letters stand for? Uh, you see, Andrea, we should have had the coffee. <laughs> ah, you see, okay. Yeah. What's, what's the U? Uncert yes. What's the C? Complexity. Ambiguity. It's impossible to read, okay. <laughs> but we have them. Um, so, we're in a world, and every era has probably thought that it was more complicated than the previous. Um, but admittedly, things accelerate today for lots of reasons, technology, globalization, etc. So what becomes increasingly the case in whatever environment we work in is that we have to factor in these different um, uh, <coughs> uh, factors, parameters, that make the work of influencing our working environment, advocacy, lobbying, or other forms, more difficult. So. What does volatile mean? As you remembered the first word, you, what does it mean to you? Yeah, volatile, yeah. Yeah, and in sometimes unexpected ways. If we look at our political context today, it's very volatile, isn't it? Uh, citizens want to get rid of, rid of the old very quickly and in unexpected ways. Okay, so that's an example. So how, what can we do about this and this, whether for lobbying or for the management of our jobs, etc.? How can we adapt to this high volatility? Can we change it? Or Expect the unexpected? Yeah, so I'll write this way. Flexibility, being able to be um, agile, prepared, updated. updated, yeah. All this which is easier said than done, but it's a reality. We need, before we go into any form of lobbying or trying to manage change, etc., to develop the capacity and to build in our work schedules time to observe, monitor, <coughs> reflect, etc. Again, you know, it might, might sound like obvious and, you know, another to do on, on, on top of all the things we have, but that's a reality that we have to save that hour every week or whatever, we, you or however you organize yourselves. Um, who wants to define 
uncertainty. I hear voices, but no? Yes, that's a bit, I, the way I understand your description is it's a bit more relative to volatility. You saying, Andrea? Research is about to pursue methods with uh, for interpretation or? Yes, it's the fact that volatility is, is very difficult to understand, but uncertainty is about the fact that you don't know what your competitor might be up to, for instance. Um, you don't know what the next internet fashion might be, the new business model on the internet, uh, the, new, um, the new social media that people will start using, etc. So there's, there's a, a greater difference or a difficulty to understand the relationship between certain causes and certain effects. So they're closely related, these two concepts, but you see this in, uh, I, I certainly saw this in the four years I just spent managing an online media, how the internet is the far west of today, but we see it in other fields where there's a constant and very difficult way um, uh, change. And so what could be the answers to this? If, you're, if you project yourself in your work environment, um, how can we adapt to that constant uncertainty? Analytical skills. Analytical skills, yeah. I'll just write analysis. Imagining future scenarios. Imagining, projecting into the future, yeah. Except when you did that, you know, like Soviet style every five years, now you have to do it constantly. Game, yeah. theory. Game theory. Now it's getting <laughs> scary. Yeah, game theory. Adapting to, maybe to use another term behind this, adapt, um, developing the skills to adapt to complexity and understand complexity, which is, I guess, also linked to the third one. Um, it's also linked to um, developing the capacity to uh, make sense of the world by developing your monitoring and indeed analytical capacity. Complexity. What's the difference between things have always been complicated, right? But now they're complex. They achieve something. They achieve something. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand. So in this case, if you, you talk about other systems that mm. have yet to achieve that, which is the case with uh, physics somehow or another, so there are people in. I see. Okay. Other, so information or knowledge based. That's not what I have in mind, but um, it's certainly. Important. The lack of hierarchy. The lack of hierarchy. Because uh, when, when there is a lack of hierarchy, you think about interaction, you, you, you don't know what to, what to define. Where to define. Okay. Multiple influences. That Multiple influences. Competing influences. Yes. So. I'm running out of space here. For me, a complicated, uh, a complex decision-making system is the EU. <laughs> it's not just complicated, because it has lots of bodies. It's complex. And why is it complex and not just complicated? Yes, and so what does that generate? Lots of information and? 
it works slowly, yeah. Yes, and all of this means that the interaction of the different parts makes it unpredictable. So your, your car engine is complex, is complicated, sorry, but you know where each piece fits and you know what the outcome will be once <laughs> they're in the right place. Okay, the EU is not like that. You don't know if Slovenia's internal politics evolve in one way or another. It will change the whole picture, the whole dynamics, etc. The interaction between the different pieces becomes the, the major factor. So that's the word I'll, I'll write here. The interconnectedness or interaction becomes a, a crucial element. Um, and therefore, in order to address this, you need here again to develop your analytical capacity and you need to combine different forms of expertise. In the old system, if you only have um, a clique of leaders and um, advisors, it might work for a while to some extent, but it creates a lot of inefficiency. But in a system like this, you're bound to make real mistakes. You need to diversify the expertise you tap into. You need to be in contact with various players who have different perspectives on the world. Otherwise, you, you, don't, you don't see the full picture, you don't see things in a, and I'll use a horrible word, in a systemic way, okay? So, I'll write systemic here. And thanks, Paolo, for the extra paper. Um, and ambiguity. Yeah. Lack of clarity. I'll write it here. Oops. So that happens, for instance, when you enter a completely new field. You don't have your bearings, and we constantly have new fields. Uh, um, in, our, in our current world. So these are a bit the, the general parameters that I think are relevant for you um, in when starting to address this concept of influencing advocacy and lobbying. Um, now, let's try and use this to understand what um, lessons it might mean for you in your various influencing um, jobs. Um, so the first thing we want to understand is, like the previous speaker said, whose name I forget? Arnold. Arnold, okay. So he said know your audience, know your target. That's the first thing. You have a target, okay? If this target is a public authority, then your influence <coughs> is lobbying, okay? If you have a wider set of objectives and actors who do their own influencing of your of this target, we'll call this advocacy. And it uses a wider set of of um, tools. We'll get back to that. But what's important to note is this decision-making target obviously has its own needs, right? It will share its power, whether in the old or in the new form, in exchange for something. So this is what we're going to talk about this trade between your target and yourselves. And so when we say know your target, we want to understand that there's an exchange of either currency or current between these two. And that's what you need to understand first and foremost. So you're going to have to ask yourself, or yourselves, if you're here, what are your resources? What can you trade? Are you going to mobilize a vast body of players and channel power to bear influence on your target? 
Are you going to trade assets with this target? You're going to have to ask what your resources are, okay? And you're going to ask, have to ask yourself then what question in order to be influential. You have resources, there's trade, so what's the other part? See, Andrea, we should have had that coffee. Because <laughs> <laughs> when I'll say it, it's really obvious. Pressure. <laughs> What's the question? You're here, you want to influence this organization or set of people. You have resources, you, you know you have um, expertise, you have maybe a power base or whatever, we'll come back to this. What's the other part of that equation? The strategy that's in between, yeah, but it's, okay, so maybe I'm not asking it properly because it's so obvious I must be asking it wrong. What are their needs? Yes, but it, so in front of your resources are the target's needs, okay? So just dissecting, know your audience, know your target. That's what it is. It's a trade between you and them, and that's the first analysis you will need to identify Obviously, a target is related to a, a goal you have from that target. I, I, I should have probably said that before, but it's obvious. You need to define your goal very precisely first. You know, are you um, seeking what it, I have stupid examples in mind. Um, you know, is <laughs> negotiating your holidays with your spouse. Or that's <laughs> maybe not the most scientific example. Um, or, you know, a salary inc increase from your, from your boss, <laughs> or um, different types of settings, maybe less personal, but you have a goal, then that equation is what are your resources, what are their needs, and you're going to have to adapt what, whatever resources you have to whatever needs the, the organization which has authority, and that will be the driving concept. So let's try and dissect this a bit. What can be the needs of T in today's world? Let's do a, a little mind map here. Trade? Yeah. Information. Information. Yeah. I didn't hear. Visibility, I heard disability, so. <laughs> <laughs> Evidence. Credibility. Stories to tell. Success, I guess, right? Success stories to tell. Popularity. Popularity. Let's put them together. We also have a target team. Popular. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, sorry, I write network. Money. <coughs> so, um, okay. Okay. What a community? 
One of those who raised their hands saying that they were involved in a um, case of lobbying or influence earlier. Could he or she or one of you volunteer to describe what's the case and then we can dissect your target's needs? <coughs> I think you did. I did, yeah. Um, well, we are lobbying at the stage to accept our input cookies. So okay. Um, our input cookies are local and regional authorities all over Europe. Yeah. The case, money yeah. As well, yeah, because it's it's every time related to the energy transition and to the need for cities to implement like uh, energy efficient measures, renewables. Um, so if we take one case. Well, one case, one current case is uh, a lot of around uh, local community energy. So making sure that more uh, players can get on the energy market. Mm -hmm. So who's the target there? A local, com a local municipality, for instance? Yeah, for example, okay. as well, it's, it's local uh, authorities, uh, city resources. So should we take Faro as a potential uh, mm -hmm. yeah. target? Yeah. Okay. And the case is, uh, the goal is we want them to be uh, developing more renewables? Yeah, we can say yes. <coughs> Just imagining, yeah. Yes. So we already have quite a few s um, sets of needs. What else could they want in this context? <coughs> Strategy. Yeah. What do you mean by that? I think by instead of attainment, they have to be solution. Mm -hmm. I'll write how, yeah, how to do it. Maybe tangible results. Yeah. Okay. I think we're not missing anything important. I don't think we're missing anything important. There's um, three broad clusters. So indeed, if you take a, a, a body that is in a position of authority, in order to maintain that authority, which is not necessarily always the case, that's something you might want to analyze and, and understand, um, but assuming they do, they will want to show that they are implementing things and doing things right. So whether elaborating a decision or implementing it, they will need these assets. They will need their own resources and they will need the know-how and they will need recognition for it. I left this one aside because I see this as a, a sort of meta uh, goal. It's part of it, right? Maintaining stability, being um, renewed in power, et cetera, the way I understand it. But it, it, it's close to this, I guess. Um, and all, the, all these... Um, needs could be broken down, right, into more specifics. Um, what, to what sort of community do they need? Uh, what sort of money? What sort of network, et cetera, do they need to implement their job? So that's the first analysis you'll need to, to conduct when undertaking any advocacy uh, job. You, you know your spouse's needs better than uh, the mayor of Faro's, uh, but still, it's the same logic. Now, what assets can you bring in front of this? And I'm looking for a different color pen. Do we have one by any chance? Ah, uh, there it is. Thank you. Um, 
So in your case, your cities, what assets do you have? Or maybe because it's easy for you to answer, what, what others think your cities has in terms of assets? Does it have a lot of money? Is it going to pay Faro to for its solar panels? Probably not, right? It has a network, yeah. So maybe it can link to people who have money, foundations, EU authorities, whatever. What are the assets that your cities have? Energy cities. <laughs> we're, we're closely working with your city. Okay, energy cities. They have success stories. <laughs> I hope so. So why is that important? It's oil in the cogs. You, you're telling your targets you can do it because we have all these examples that it works, that it had benefits, etc. What are the resources do you, does Energy Cities have? Yeah, I draw a big circle around all of this one. How can they contribute on the other fronts? Can they help the mayor gain votes? Energy cities. Yes? So how might energy cities do that? Because they won't be, I presume, campaigning for, any, uh, for the mayor of Faro. It, it, it is presumably something to think about, absolutely, but to illustrate how to think about this, how might energy cities help the mayor get recognition <coughs> for what's being done? Okay. Well, you use different words that connect here. Because your Energy Cities has a network of other cities, it's listened to by EU authorities, I assume. Um, because it has a lot of uh, a bank of uh, database of um, examples, etc., it can, I assume, interest the Mayor Faro in maybe running for this year's Energy Cities Pride of Renewable Cities and getting recognition through, through that, uh, being shared in its newsletters of things going on, which in turn the Mayor can use to say, hey look, we're talking about us and the rest of Europe. Intangible soft power <coughs> perhaps, but nevertheless uh, potentially very helpful. Now that I've been thinking in the abstract. Maybe you can give us more specific um, resources. Thing that I said yesterday in my uh, intervention, 
but we always preferred to have the mayors as spokespersons for our poetry request <coughs> instead of just being a network who is asking for, for this. So I think as a mayor is saying it in the name of all the mayors that are behind the network, it makes makes the, 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 the request much more uh, credible and, and legitimate in the end. Um, yeah, and then it's, uh, I think, all about showing also their their results and, and making them visible in any type of communication activities that we can have on both online and offline in terms of the events and things like that. Okay. Great. Well that that's a very helpful example. And to recapitulate and we'll move on, first step you want to ask yourselves in which power world are you evolving? Second, you want to be prepared to face a very volatile, etc., context by having the adequate structure in place. And you're not the US Army here, I, I know, <laughs> where the concept originated. But even in your work environment, in a very simple way, you need to have the time and the teams organized to prepare for the change. Third step, you will define what you want and therefore who the target is. And you will therefore define what its needs are and what resources you can bring against it. The, the needs of the target can be multifaceted. It's organizational, it's professional, it's at the individual level. It can therefore also be psychological. You want to understand, again, know your target. As, as I said, Anna did 90% of the job. We're just unpacking this. But this mind map, you will do by yourselves, but you need to take time doing it. Because then you can do what I would call acupuncture, where you can pinpoint your needle exactly where it helps, not where it hurts, or maybe where it hurts, but then the needle helps release the, uh, the power in the right place. Fifth step, you need to have an analysis of, well, I'll call it the policy cycle, because, again, I was originally thinking in the context of uh, strictly lobbying, but let's call it the decision-making cycle more generally. And you know, I was a, um, a public affairs, i.e. lobbying consultant for many years. And it's amazing how common sense, what our advice was often, and how common sense this might seem. Uh, but how often people overlook this. Why? Because um, in a decision-making cycle, Often, the point of decision-making, which is towards the end, that's where the crisis might emerge. People think, oh, we don't like that decision, and uh, we're going to mobilize against it. And we see many examples in, in policy-making of this, where, um, well, in particular at EU level, you know, you have a long process of decision, of negotiation at EU level, and suddenly a national organization and national industry realizes that this is not in their interest and they argue against it. And I'm French at the moment. Um, the, um, the, 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 the rail strikes are in opposition to um, issues that were discussed and maybe they're very legitimate, that's not the point. But the, the, the strikes are taking place about 10 years after the negotiations at EU level for liberalization of uh, certain forms of rail transport. So maybe, and I don't, th there was some protest along the line at that time, but it's at the very end that there's the most mobilization. So this is not necessarily an example of an industry or s a set of stakeholders wa waiting till the end. They've been concerned about this for many years. But the level of intensity, you know, this is the longest ever rail strike in French history. 
is at a point where it's too late really to, to change much. Unless the French government decided to go against what has been decided at EU level and by its predecessors and abandon it, uh, which is unlikely from a political strategy perspective. So at EU level, this is very often the case, but in general, this is often the case that you know, the crisis appears, but the forces at play were operating you know, for a long time. So again, a very commonsensical and obvious thing to say one it said is you need to be in advocacy mode all the time because in order to develop your resources your networks your knowledge your credibility with that will be assets in relation to your different targets you don't build it at the last minute right so um, that requires an approach to advocacy where this is integrated in your everyday job. So here, presumably, you all have very different needs and different objectives. But if you take a broad notion of advocacy as influencing those who have the power to make your lives better, <laughs> well, yes, that's where some of us are better at networking than others. Some of us are better at publicizing their efforts and their good cases than others, etc. And some like it more than others, and some don't like it. But it's a, it's a reality that if you don't develop that treasure hove of assets in relation to your prospective needs, when the decision time comes and you haven't done that, you're in a worse position. Um, so for instance, uh, in energy cities, I can imagine, doesn't just lobby uh, the mayor of Faro or the EU institutions when there's a decision-making point, but publishes reports, organizes conferences, um, provides helpful services to people constantly, right? And maybe you want to give examples of what you do to cultivate your bank of resources. Does anybody have else have any examples of how you're trying early on to be helpful in your different environments? So the two insights here are be helpful and be early. Anybody has any good practice or that you know of, if you don't want to seem to be bragging, but uh, bragging is allowed. Give us good examples. No good practices. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. But this is a very new test, so we don't have everything in place ready to take the test. Okay, but you're, you seem to be trying to be helpful and, and be early, okay? Okay, so having done this analysis, you can identify what's lacking in your uh, resources and therefore who you might want to team up with over time to be helpful. It's a bit the same as, you know, you don't want to be annoying your friends just by calling them once every two years when you need their... Uh, screwdriver or um, to borrow money from them, right? That's not how you treat a relationship in everyday life. So it's the same with advocacy and influence. You have your set of stakeholders, you build alliances, you build friendships. These are people. This lobbying is not a process between, maybe someday, robots. It's a process between people. And therefore it needs to be nurtured and your own assets, you may be limited, but you can complement them with others. You can also do that in the spur of a campaign. I, I, I'll always remember this example that I was um, witnessing when I was in my first lobbying job in the UK. And those were the days when um, we still had um, radio tapes, you know? So uh, these were essentially made by um, Japanese companies and as blank tapes, people use them to record music and uh, shows, etc. So there was a copyright issue. Now, the UK government wanted to introduce a tax on blank radio tapes to that effect for uh, intellectual property rights to redistribute it to uh, the music industry, etc. But the Japanese tape manufacturers weren't happy about this because this was going to be a tax on their product. Now, what did they do? They couldn't go around and say, uh, Japanese tape manufacturers are wonderful, uh, you know, don't give us, uh, don't hand, um, don't impose a tax on our business. They allied with a very unlikely um, partner, and this was the result of our brainstorming inside <coughs> the, um, uh, the consultancy I worked for. We thought, who uses blank tapes? Um, so, teenagers, um, everyone, you know, in the office, dictaphone, whatever. And then at one point we thought, well, blind people, blind people who uh, have, who record books, who share books recorded on tapes, who uh, record radio programs, etc. At that time, at that point in time, it was an, a, a very important element in their daily lives. So we approached the Blind People's Trust and asked them, are you happy about this tax on um, blank tapes? And they were not. They were really not happy about it because this was going to be a very significant problem for them. So we um, put them in the front of the advocacy campaign and we helped them voice their concern. Very legitimate. Might seem cynical to you, but this was a public interest concern, you know. But it was more receivable as, um, you know, the, the blind people saying it than Japanese tape manufacturers. Um, so you want to build coalitions with people who have assets that you may not have and, and share an interest that you both have. Um, how much time before the next coffee? <laughs> 10 minutes. <laughs> um, so, I'll introduce another notion, and if I may have more paper, which is um, it's maybe we can put it over it. So I'll um, I'll skip over these five examples I wanted to give you of new ways of organizing power, etc., which illustrate this division. But I'll I'll finish if we have ten minutes by giving you uh, very basic tools 
for you to address the first step in the exercise we, you will have later. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Um, so, the first thing you want to define having done that analysis is what will be your overall message and positioning. Okay, so let's say your ener um, energy cities or your the Japanese uh, tape manufacturers or whatever interests you represent. You want to define your positioning and your approach. How are you going to go into all this? Now that you've analyzed your resources, the other party's needs, who are the needs, your goals, etc. Um, and we'll do that on a piece of paper. I think better with a piece of paper. Um, so your positioning is the main message and the rationale you will present. So to illustrate with um, the, the, the Japanese tape manufacturers, the message is not free trade with Japan and uh, more jobs in Japan, right? Um, that could be a message, but we don't anticipate it's gonna work well. The message is freedom of creation, um, ability for uh, people in need to have an extra tool that brings added quality in their life, etc. So in order to, thank you very much, in order to get to that point of your positioning, how you position yourself, you're going to have to identify identity, what your identity is. Oh yeah. Um, so what are your key characteristics? What defines you? And therefore, um, in relation to your target's position and needs, what you're lacking. So in, in this case, let's take again Japanese manufacturers, uh, an understanding that it may not be them that should be in front first. Um, you want to understand the context as we've analyzed target needs, etc. And combined with your objectives, spelling them out, you will define your messaging, your positioning, sorry, which constitutes, which is um, made of an overall message. So again, like uh, the, the Japanese manufacturers, uh, what you're seeking to provide, and then a rationale. Why does it matter? And usually, here you want wider benefits, you know, not benefits to yourself, but the public interest, let's say, benefits, the collective interest. And if we have more time, we can dissect them, but the usual ones are, what can you think of? This will procure benefits to others, of what type? I'm acting in the common interest. I'm not acting as a Japanese manufacturer for my own good. What could be these general benefits? Social? So equity, fairness. What else? Um, so I, put, I would put a more general category, quality of life. Freedom, oops, what are the types of benefits can you claim to bring, to be heard? Gender equality. Gender equality. Capacity building. Employment, Employment is a... Um, yeah. Under economy, jobs is, yeah. I was hesitating to show you um, a few press releases from just last week looking at different lobbies in Brussels. Almost every time you see jobs in there. Growth. Growth, yeah. <coughs> environmental impact. 
Absolutely. Increasingly, sustainability in the wider sense. Health. Health. Etc. But in your in this process, you will want to find the right words that match this context, your identity, and your objectives. And you want to be credible afterwards. That we won't have time in the exercise to build the credibility, but you want to think what in your resources makes you credible to say this. Okay, so maybe in your storytelling in the exercise, you want to think about this. You'll be di given different roles. You'll, you can imagine why and how you back it up. Okay? Um, and then you will, from there, define your approach or your strategy. Oops. Oh, I need the coffee as well. Sorry. <laughs> so here, there's basically, to use that uh, center of gravity again, let's imagine this is uh, planet Earth, or a planet, whatever, that's your target. One approach, which we call insider lobbying, or insider whatever, influence, is the, the one normally people tend to um, give priority to. It is the ability to land on that planet, to go into that authority's office and provide all the assets we've talked about, the information, the expertise, the networks, etc. So it's to be in a close relationship with that group. And um, when you look at different lobbying situations, um, those who usually have the most influence, not necessarily always, but are those who have a very close relationship with the center of authority. Um, you have some that have close authority because they are <coughs> instrumental to the issue. So for instance, if you look at DG Enterprise talking about car industry regulations, the car manufacturers have the door open, they're in regular meetings there. Then you have specialist insiders, so maybe uh, WWF, uh, the environmental organization, might not be such an insider for DG Enterprise, but they know they need to consult them on um, emission standards, for instance, because they have expertise, or a health organization, for instance. And then you have um, some more peripheral insiders who, um, who have very occasional reason to be involved. So here, if I take my example of uh, DG Enterprise and the car industry, I would put HEAL, which is the Health and Environment Alliance. So it's people who specialize on how uh, pollution affects health, etc. And a bit closer, you have WBF, and really close, you have ASEA, which is the Euro Alliance of uh, Car Manufacturers of Europe. I think it's in French, whatever. Um, then you have a wider circle of outsider groups. And you have groups that are outside the, the closed circle of negotiation, some by choice, ideologically. We do not want to be seen as being part of this world. So sometimes this is a choice Greenpeace will make. You know? um, they will denounce, they will protest, they will do different types of uh, activities. And sometimes people are outside by necessity. They want to be in, but they're rejected by, let's say here, if it's DG Enterprise, there's some groups they just don't want to listen to. Um, and so they can be potential insiders 
who would like to be in but haven't yet been invited. Now, when you define your strategy, you want to define where you want to be on these different circles, whether you want to be inside or not, for questions of positioning, whether you want to be seen as constructive or radical, um, and therefore also in the spirit of coalition building, who are your allies and where are they on this map as well. So a key element in all of this is you'll need to develop what's called a stakeholder map. So again, negotiating the next holidays with your spouse, the stakeholder map is easily done in your mind. You need to get your kids on board for your plan and maybe the mother-in-law, but in the case of a more complex um, advocacy or lobbying strategy, you want to be able to develop your own analysis to them. What is, what are their needs, what are their resources, what is their overall message at the moment, who might be your allies, who might be, uh, what might be the different coalitions, etc. So a stakeholder map is an absolutely essential step in an advocacy campaign and something you need to spend quite a bit of time doing uh, and, and monitoring. Um, I'll finish maybe with a, a couple messages that I think are valid in any context. Um, lobbying is associated with very negative values of influencing and distorting and uh, you know, selfish uh, interests, etc., which it can be. But therefore, it's all the more important to have some ethical approach to lobbying, to be transparent in particular about what you're doing. Um, again, use the image of developing relationships in your social circles. This is about social interactions. So you never want to distort facts. You'll get caught up with this. You never want to uh, play people in, 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 in non-transparent ways, etc. Again, it this might seem obvious, but when people get involved in you know, tense situations with interests at stake, um, I've seen it as a consultant, they tend to forget this. Um, you want to, uh, also something which might seem obvious, you want to think politically. Y you know, when, I, when we say know your audience, your audience here, it's a social context, but it's a political context about getting reelected, about getting an advantage, etc. So you, you, you have to have that frame of mind, even if it doesn't come naturally, you can't be naive about these things. Um, and you need to be very strong. I can imagine energy cities, from having seen their work, is, is very much in line with this. You need to be very strong <coughs> in your expertise. This is most likely the strongest asset you can bring. You usually don't want to build your think in terms of money and think that will be your resource, whether money that you can deploy to make a lot of noise or other. Your key asset will be probably first and foremost the information you can bring, how to be helpful in that way, and the networks you can bring. So you want to cultivate those uh, actively and have that, um, you know, in an ethical approach as your as your main uh, dimension, to uh, your main um, parameter. So, trying to adapt to a very broad range of things, um, you'll hopefully recall these different uh, steps that you can apply in different settings, and we'll do an exercise later to to see how it works. Thank you. Thank you.